It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to this seminar on behalf of Gallery Navya. As you know, we are here on the occasion of Case Radha Krishnan's retrospective exhibition. The exhibition has been a lively success over the past 20 days with many visitors engaging with the work and a curator's walk by Professor Siva Kumar. Radha Krishnan has been working with figurative sculpture for many years now, and yet what he does with these figures is something very special. They express philosophy, emotion, energy, playfulness, and even movement. The exhibition naturally opens the question, what exactly are the different aspects of figurative sculpture, and how has it evolved over time? It's a privilege to be able to explore such questions with some of the best theorists and practitioners in the field of art. We have with us a very distinguished thinker, Sadanan Menin, who has a rich experience of working in the worlds of art, culture, political thought, academics, and media. We have with us Ina Puri, who is a very well-known art curator, writer, documentarian, and collector. I know we will benefit greatly from her views. We have Ramu Kataka, who is such an eminent architect and design thinker with many path-breaking design projects. To his credit, we are also very happy to have Christine Michael amongst us. Christine is both a scholar of Indian ceramics and a ceramic artist, who is a curator as well. And finally, we have Radha Krishnan himself, who promises to tell us of the stories behind the making of portraits, not just his own stories, but also of the 20th century legends he trained under in Santi Nikit. With that, I invite Mr. Menin, who has kindly consented to moderate this seminar. I invite you, sir, may we start with the proceeding. May I invite all the speakers to be here with us. And I want to thank you all, our distinguished audience, the collectors who are here, the art uh, lovers and connoisseurs, thank you very much for being with us. And here is Mr. Menin. Okay, good evening. And if uh, everybody's taken their seat, probably we can begin. Thank you, Tripath, for having uh, organized this session. And uh, you need not have given an elaborate introduction. I think all, all that needed to be said was that all on the panel here are friends of Raja for a long time, <laughs> each going back 30, 40 years, so it's like a gang of friends sitting and talking. So I guess it will be more informal that we talk about. It, for me, it's very, how do you say, there's a serendipity moment for me today when I stepped out of the India Habitat Center where I'm staying for the next two days. And I come out and right there in front of me is the harvest by Ramkinkar Badge. I'm coming to this session where probably Radha saw harvest being made in front of his eyes, or at least got inspired by it, one of his teachers, main teachers. So, and that's a figurative work, but a figurative work of a particular kind of a power and a particular kind of a animation, let's say, that that farmer who's about to thresh the sheaf of wheat is monumental. It's, 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 not, it's, it's not some delicate creature, it's not some starving farmer. It's a powerful, monumental figure who's like a image of something that comes out of earth and uh, is, is going to contribute to the survival of society. So that, that kind of power is inherent in that, in that particular figure and is very inspiring. So I was wondering, <coughs> today's uh, panel or seminar or whatever you want to call it, is titled Com Contemporary Figurative Sculpture. I'm going to eliminate the contemporary part of it. I'm going to eliminate the sculpture part of it. I'm going to focus a bit on the idea of the figurative. What exactly is are we talking about when we say figurative? Primarily, let's pose it as a conceptual issue. What provocation does a figurative work of art provide? Is there a provocation at all? Because figurative is normally associated with the narrative normally associated with something recognizable. Oh, and I understand, that's a man, that's a woman, that's a bullock, that's a tree, whatever. It, it's easy to comprehend. It's a, a, a dumb person's game. You know, the figurative tells you the story, even as you see it. You don't need someone to hold, hold your hand and 
take you through it, unlike in a more abstract work. But then we are talking about figurative in a in a land in a society where, for God knows how many thousand years, every stone is a shivaling. It's conceptually sacralized. It's conceptually worshipped. Need not have the shape of uh, you know an, an anthropomorphic shape. It's, it's just a piece of stone, and it can become a shiv. It can become a hanuman. It can. It, it's very, particularly these days. It's very 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 scary. You know to. To, to sort of toss a stone somewhere because you might be hurting somebody's sentiment and all that sort of thing. So it's, it's a peculiar society we are in where stones have a sacrality, forms and figures have a certain sacrality. And when they become figures, then uh, where exactly does that take us? It becomes a uh, issue worth pondering. So the figurative therefore <coughs> enables a narrative coherence. Uh, there is a certain comprehensibility and an ease of meaning that it provides, because also it's often representational, uh, if not a literal representation, at least a symbolic representation. And uh, yet we have something like, despite the abstraction of uh, sculpture that that was evident, we also have at least over 2,000 years of a history of the figurative. Uh, uh, in the Indian context, whether it's in stone or marble or uh, uh, metal or, and so on. And if you want to take it even further, 5,000 years, then right there at the entrance to the exhibition, Radha's homage to the so-called dancing girl of Mohenjo-daro, which is uh, in the National Museum, it's only this high, four and a half inches, but here it's expanded into something else. So so the figurative has played a role in, in, in our minds. It has sort of appeared before us in, in, in various forms in the embodiments of, for example, the feminine principle, the mother goddesses, the saptamatrikas, the uh, shalabhanjikas, the karmariyamans, and all, all, all invested with a certain kind of supernatural force, uh, including uh, images of, the, of uh, nagas and uh, stupas and so on. They are all invested with a certain kind of force. However, in the modern era, divested of that kind of sacrality, where does the provocation lie in the figurative? And it's a question that I'm posing generally, it's a question to the panel, it's a question to an artist like Raja. How does one pull out a provocation and not make a sculptural work something that is tame and conformist and uh, uh, something that uh, merges with the landscape and certain th something that I mean, the horror of horror, something that becomes acceptable in no time. Uh, then there is a potential of that work of art which becomes acceptable. Radha's own teacher, Ramkinkar Baj, like I said, sought it in uh, the mundane, the uh, everyday life of the subaltern, and, and so on. The, uh, the harvester of the Santal woman, the mill call, etc. And even return to the Yakshi, the, uh, outside the RBI building here, the Yakshi, which one of the most powerful sculptures made in India, uh, which then did inspire other sculptors, whether it's Kanai, in Kerala, for example, Kanai Kuniraman or Rimzan or uh, uh, Krishna Kumar or uh, Ashokan Padwal, they all got charged by, by, by that, that power. Uh, or the Madras school sculptors who took a completely different route under Devi Prasad Roy Chaudhary and uh, came up with a completely different idiom of the figurative in the works of people like Manuswami, or Dhanapal, or Stapati, or Nandagopal, and so on, P.S. Nandan. Uh, or in the Bengal school, you know, Sharbiri Roy Chaudhary, who introduced a lyricality to that. To that. And again, Tada had the privilege of uh, having worked an apprentice with Sharbiri Roy Chaudhary, one of the most ly lyrical, uh, you know, figurative artists of our time. Or Meera Mukherjee's enormously powerful female figures, and so on. So, essentially, modern Indian sculptor has chosen to engage with uh, two aspects which probably were not so clear in the more ancient works, which is an engagement with space on the one hand and time on the other. The engagement with, with space is with uh, getting more familiar with the idea of the negative space, that is the carving, the in-between space, the interstice, the niche, and so on, which makes the figure stand out, which makes the figure dynamic. I would say Radha's strength lies in, in, in that kind of uh, carving space in a, in a very very special and a very dramatic and very powerful manner. And the other engagement with time is uh, to work with the incremental evidence of uh, daily transitions, 
and uh, in the formation of say, roughness and patina and color of the material. There's a beautiful Japanese word for it called saba. Saba is highly regarded in Japan as being a marker of the rust of time, time which imposes rust on material. Even on paper, uh, they call it rust, the aging of paper. And all material that ages, that shows its age. It doesn't hide its age, it shows its age, considered to be of very high quality. But the question again remains, where does the provocation lie in all this? And for me, I think, interview I did probably 30, 35 years ago with Radha for an article in the Economic Times. He had told me about something that Ram Kinkar Badge communicated to him while he was a student, which was constantly saying, break the form, break the form. Don't stay with the form. Go, go to the structure inside. Now, that's a, definitely a provocation. Here is a sculptor setting out to make a form, a figurative sculptor. And the exhortation to him is, break the form. Go to the structure. Sculpture is a static medium. Learn to animate it. I would have loved to have a teacher like that who, who <laughs> exhorted me to do exactly the opposite of what you're working with. Here you're trying to create a status in movement. It's, it's a freezing of time. All these figures you see here, it's a status, and you're being exhorted to animate it. So one of the biggest challenges that a sculptor could, could be posed, uh, and I think this is, the, this is the kernel of that issue, you know, how to break the form and animate it. No wonder those who are from an art background and have read, for example, the Chitra Sutra from the Vishnu Dharmotra Purana, there is a very interesting conversation between sage Markandeya and... Uh, King Vaj Vajra, in which Vajra is asking Sage Markandeya, how do I make a good sculpture? And Markandeya says, closes his eyes, reflects and says, go and learn dance. Then he says, how do I become a good dancer? Go and learn architecture. And how do I become a good architect? Go and learn music. How do I learn good music? Go and learn mathematics. So, so on it goes. It's a whole tour for around 64 hours and comes back to sculpture. So obviously the sculptor has to know how to dance. I don't know how much. That's probably danced to other people's tunes, but I don't know, I don't know whether he's danced himself. So with this uh, thought, I just want to open this panel with that thought about figurative and provocation. What can be a provocation in a, in a, in a medium like this? And how, do, how does an artist struggle to engage with it and sort of reflect on that? And uh, I have a very distinguished set of people sitting with me, each, each, each of them distinguished in their own fields and who definitely have thought of it from their own perspective. So I'll begin from that end. I'll begin with Ramu Katakam, again a very old dear friend, and uh, how you would like to think around this, this thought. Uh, so Dhanand has been very comprehensive on uh, developing an idea of contemporary sculpture, which is what we are talking about. And Radha, I think, is uh, perhaps the uh, person who has taken the Shantaniketan revolution, as it were, which started early in the 20th century by Tagore. And we were talking about it earlier, that Tagore was someone who considered art and architecture and music he reintroduced it to India, and with what Sadanand said about Ram Kinkar, who is one of the people who really broke boundaries, and then there's the tradition of Santaniketan very taught, and now we see Radha continuing this process of movement and allowing a kind of freedom of spirit, which Ram Kinkar started, and the whole Santaniketan uh, ethos of bringing new things to India, and I think we are emerging as it were, and, and Radha clearly shows, so I'm not talking about provocation, I'm just talking about the way that I see Radha's evolution and uh, the way that he has presented the contemporary way of, you know, doing sculpture. And I think he's constantly working on that, and that's what makes it fascinating. And this exhibition shows this evolution, because people who know Ram Kinkar's uh, work, and his connections with the Santal families, Radha has followed up. And this is what I find the most fascinating, the connection between the simple Santal tribe and Shantaniketan, Tagore, the other end of the... So Tagore uh, has been able to recognize, and so has uh, Ram Kinkar been able to recognize, and Radha has shown us today what is possible in contemporary sculpture. 
So those are my comments, but I it not doesn't exactly uh, address the provocation. So thank you very much, Mr. Menon, and that was an amazing introduction. So taking it further from here, coming to the present exhibition specially, I would like to compliment Shiva Kumar first of all. Shiva Kumar and Radha met at the Shantiniketan railway station in somewhere in 1974 when they were both students in their early 20s. And since then, they have been uh, in touch. They have worked together. They have shared their, you know, the, the process of their work. Shiva Kumar went on to do art history. Radha went to do sculpture. And it is because of this very intimate knowledge that Shiva Kumar has that we have been able to see this present body of work my compliments also go to Navya Gallery and Tripath and Meher for putting this amazing exhibition together. Not only do we get to see the sculpture, including the crowd right here, where each and every person in the crowd has a different expression, has a different mood. Someone is laughing, someone is jokey, the other person is serious. I mean, we have all these people in the same space, but inhabiting a world which is entirely their own. And only Radha Krishnan could have done that because Radha has been working with this form for, for many, many years. Coming to very recent times, I was in Shantaniketan till day before yesterday and in the Kola Bhavun alongside Shomnathor, Sharburi, Ramkinkar Bej, it was a pleasure to see Radha Krishnan's work. So I think that is what he has achieved as a sculptor, the fact that he has reached this space and he's one amongst, I mean, amongst all these equals. So I just have this to say that Radha's whole perception, the way he has moved away. I mean, we have Dhruva also working, you know, in the figurative form, Dhruva Mistri. We have Ravinder Reddy who is working with the sculptural form of, of temples and then taking it on in a very different manner. And then we have Radha, whose work, especially Masai and Maya, these two characters. So we have this Shantal boy who Radha had met as a student. And this boy came and he would model for all these art students. And he, Radha met him then. But when Radha left Shantiniketan to pursue, uh, you know, his, his, his work, he took memories of this boy with him. And it is this boy that we have continued to see down the years in many different forms. Even today, you know, he and Maya are the, they are the hero and heroine of the present body of work. And it is quite, quite outstanding. I have known Radha now for perhaps 25 more years. Seeing the ramp, it was a nightmare installing the ramp in Calcutta, I remember doing that. But he has only moved, he has evolved, his work has evolved. And today as I sit here, I've seen the paper works, for instance, and though it's not sculpture, it is an amazing body of work that he has done with Paper Nest in collaboration with them in Shantaniketan. The drawings that we have got to see here, it just goes to show that Radha has, of course, made a mark for himself as a sculptor, but also as a printmaker, as an artist. All these other roles that he has played, all these other avatars have also been equally impressive. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ina. Of course, one is gathered here in, in this panel in the presumption that everybody knows Radha's work and has seen it, seen the exhibition, and uh, it's based on that that we are talking. So thank you very much for that overview all over again. Uh, Christine? Uh, thank you very much, Gallery Navya, for having me join this esteemed panel. And also, Radha, I'm honored to be speaking along with your own inspiring body of work right here at Bikaner House. One interruption, one interruption. <laughs> In the first gallery, as you enter on the left extreme, you'll see a bust of Christine Michael, <laughs> done when she was a baby. <laughs> okay, just as a background, Radha, Mimi and I have had a friendship for over 40 years. I was a young NID graduate starting to work at the Gari Pottery Studios, and they were in the sculpture and printmaking studios, and so was Himmat Shah. So later, when I was a young actress, yes, in my earlier avatar, Radha kindly lent his sculptures for the Yathrik play Road to Mecca that, that my mother directed. And this was performed at the Sri Ram Center basement. And I played the role of the female sculptor who had lost her way with the art. Well, find my way, I eventually did. 
but that's another story. As I watched Radha and Himmat Bhai work, I was absorbed by the materiality of sculpture, both metal and clay, and was engrossed in the use of fire in both sculptural mediums and as the transforming element. Both materials span centuries of the hand of man using this elemental material and reflect changing cultural expression. Both are, you know, really dynamic and evolving art forms. And I'm going to share my thoughts on the nature of the sculptural space and the materiality of both mediums. The material itself is central, is a central element of the artistic concept and its expressive potential. Radha has his, in his span of work, challenged the traditional perception of bronze or the figure being of a solid medium as he has brought into his figures space and air. Here in pottery, space and air are contained within the form and work as the positive charged space that forms the outer shape. When we throw on the potter wheel, we move our hands inside and, you know, try and sort of billow out the shape. So that inside shape, uh, air is the really the charged space. However, clay, sand and wax, both vital mediums in the making process of bronze casting, and those they are considered temporal, ephemeral, transient, a waste material for a nobler medium like bronze, not durable. Bronze cannot do without them. They have jointly endured over centuries as shards and markers of culture. So Radha sculptures enclose space and air very differently, encompassing a spatial dynamics of alignment and balance and orientation that engages the viewer in a very different way to anything that sort of figurative ceramics does. It encourages one to move around the form, thereby influencing the perception of the figure. The sculptural space thus extends beyond the physical boundaries of the artwork itself and includes in it the relationship with the surrounding architecture, the habitat and the landscape. So for me, there is a sense of frozen kinetic spatial experience and this introduces an element of time into the dynamics of the viewer. This changing perception and perspective adds a temporal dimension to the visual experience. The sense of touch is also inherent in, in this dynamic, in both the materials. Texture and surface brings an emphasis to the materiality. So there in ceramics, you know, color is such an important element. We always look at the glazes, etc. And one always thinks that it is necessary to have that color. But in Radha's work, we learn that it need not be so. The sky brings in the color. So does the morning and the evening light. And the play of shadows creates a dance of forms that contribute significantly to the poetics of the work. Radha has always used the sky and the sea to bring in elements of color as light plays along the lines of the dancing form. And I've seen his work, work in Goa where he plays with the sea in a very, very beautiful manner. We both did a commission for Mr. Pradeep Sachdeva at the Garden of Five Senses back in the 90s, where Radha's sculpture danced across the sky up on the high top of a stony hill, and mine was the tall blue double helix spiral using the element of sound and air with the bells, with sort of ceramic bells. So the recent paper and metal sculptural reliefs, which even Ina sort of mentioned, are for me a new direction of your work, Radha, and I hope that the next few decades of your work will see a pioneering sort of direction from you using these materials. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, I think that was a very good encapsulation of what Radha has been up to and where he's going to move in the near future. Maybe you'll come to a stage where this kind of monumentality, I will jokingly call petrified eroticism in, in, your, in, in your work. Maybe that stage has come to a pause and you're taking on to a more flatter, flatter dimension, which is very fascinating to see. We deliberately kept uh, Radha at the end so that uh, it gets a little bit more dark and he had to show a few things. Uh, it's, still, it's still a bit dicey. So maybe, maybe we can chat some more. Another 10 minutes we can chat. Ramu, would you like to add some more to what you said? 
Well, uh, since uh, we are talking about personal matters that we all know him, as you said, you are a gang of five here, yeah, and we all know each other for the last 30 or 40 years. So I met Radha uh, by chance, and uh, we decided to start a small gallery in an urban village called Kirki. In those days, it was in the 90s when nobody knew uh, what gallery was or urban village but uh, we did try and and i think that was a kind of pioneering spirit that both radha and i uh, decided to do and it was a lot of fun we also exhibited a lot of his work and the spatial quality of that gallery was enhanced by sculpture the idea was to try and introduce sculpture to to an architecture and to a village it was very experimental and I think uh, both of us learned a great deal, but it was an idea of trying to see what uh, sculpture can do to architectural spaces. And we well know how well it, the two work, especially with the light that we were able to produce in that gallery. Uh, so these are the experiences that we started the work with. Of course, Radha has come a very long way since then, and his crowd, as we call it, is it called the crowd? Yeah. I think is quite a fascinating piece of work, and I saw it being done in Sant Niketan uh, in his studio, and there were all these sort of rough sculptures there, which had a kind of um, unfinished quality of these 50 pieces, which had a different sense of, uh, you know, expectation, as it were. And now that I see it here in the open air, he's been able to convey the sense of moving within a crowd, but I do feel it could also, and I think he did exhibit it in an enclosed space. I think it also needs an enclosed space, which makes it feel the crowd sort of compresses the, oh, yes, co compresses the space. I think the idea of having an open air might not be as successful as if it was in a large enclosed space. But still it needs the light. So these are my thoughts on this rather magnificent piece of his. It really outdoes a lot of his work. And I think if this is the direction he's going to go, then we have lots to look forward to. So I think with that, let me get back to... <laughs> no, I think uh, that period when you were in Kirki village and sharing uh, that beautiful studio, a distinguished neighbor you had was, I think, Prabuddha Das Gupta, the photographer, who has photographed some of Radha's early works, which absolutely delightful the, the way he's photographed that and filled it again with, you know, light and movement and, and so on. Uh, yeah, so uh, I think uh, uh, we could take a few questions from the floor uh, before uh, we move on to Radha and this projection. We'll give you some more time to have a darker stream. <laughs> Yeah. एक जो कलाकार की जो कला यात्रा होती है वो एकदम कंप्लीट नहीं हो जाती एकदम पूरी नहीं हो जाती है तो शुरू से लेके अब तक उसमें क्या स्टेजेस आई है एक क्वेश्चन तो ये है क्योंकि एकदम ये जो फिनिश प्रोडक्ट आप देखते हैं उसके पहले बहुत सारी चीजें ऐसी तो आपकी एक कला प्रक्रिया क्या रहती बनाने की जो प्रक्रिया है वही दिखाने वाले हैं वही दिखाने वाले हैं ओके तो ठीक है मैंने पहले प्रश्न पूछ लिया ऐसा लगता है आई वाज वेटिंग फॉर इट बी डार्क uh, so that I could show some slides, you know, of uh, some of the work in progress and some of the experiences. Set of the anecdotes that I would like to share. You know, here, uh, being in Shantanikadan as a student, watching some of the great masters of, like, Sharbir Rai Chaudhary, Ram Kinkar Bej, and, and uh, uh, some other sculptors. But now, um, yeah, I, I am very glad that Sadhananda has sort of brought it out, talking about you know that the, the 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 interview that we had long back for where prior to exhibiting my sculptures in France, that was in 1993 for the first time I had a major show, and um, and we spoke about Ram Kinkar because those years, you know, uh, it was not that Ram Kinkar works were very very popular, and also his the way he the methods that he adopted in terms of the working nature, that was not really very, very known to many people those years. I spoke about, it's true, I spoke about the structure. So that I would like to talk about a little bit. I remember Ram Ginkar comes to the sculpture department, though he was not a part of the faculty. He was, re he retired in 1970, but he was still 
living in the campus. So he used to come to the department because he never used any other private space for his own work. Whether it's a painting or sculpture, he always comes to the department. And students could see him at work. And that was the kind of, because, and he, I, I mean, we all knew about, he comes and looks at a student's work, a completed, a, maybe a nude study, a life-size work that he looks at it and he takes the student to, is definitely excited to show him. Here is the master and he is going to come up with a comment. What exactly has happened? He would take a knife in his hand and he would start slowly cutting the sculptures. Cut from all the sides to reach to the armature. And uh, he said, my boy, I wanted to show you where you did the mistake. The mistake was in the core structure of it. The problem, you know, anybody, you can complete it. Completing a sculpture is so easy, but to start the work is so tough. To make the beginning is the biggest task. So he would really sort of show the core structure is the most important aspect of making a first sculpture. So when we were told, you make the structure first, the armature first, and you see the you can see the complete structure in the very beginning of the structure itself. That was an incredible learning for us. I mean, we didn't understand when, it, when we were young, but as even today also, we are still trying to sort of explore what he meant by that. You know, like um, he would go himself, he would go to the paddy field, looking at the workers, the harvesters, and then he would draw from life, and he comes back, so he has many sketchbooks, but he comes back to his own personal studio, his own space. And then he comes up with the harvester that what you have seen at India Habitat Center. You know that it has nothing to do with what he was drawing. So he, but he was extremely good at drawing from life. And then comes up with a kind of a structure which is absolutely different. The harvester, which is very geometrical, structurally very stable. And he called it an unknown political prisoner. That's the way he called that harvester, which is displayed at uh, the India Habitat Center. So why, where does he get that sort of an idea that you have to work from the memory? You don't, you study from life, then you go back to your own, you, a kind of attempt to work with a kind of a recollecting memories. That was the kind of a process. So I'm talking, I mean, there is, you can see it. This is Ram Kinger stand, you know, working before the Tagore. It was one of the time a chance that he had this Tagore says, sitting for, Ram King was a model, and Ram King was extremely excited that the poet has given him time to work. So when he started working on, because that time poet was sitting and reading, and uh, Ram King comes with his clay and everything to this, his home in Uttarayan. But then you know what? One of the comments that Ram King, uh, sorry Tagore, made to the way of working while he was almost completing the sculpture, that he told him in Bangla. You know, the means that to me, you know, you are, you are looking at me and you are seeing too much of me. You are seeing too much of me while working. Yeah. So then uh, that was something that Ram Kinkar on the spot did not understand what he meant by that. Is it an appreciation or whether it is a criticism? He could not understand what he meant by that. You are seeing a lot of me. And he, next day, I mean, he went... When the poet was not sitting, he cut both the hands, he cuts them off, and he really started understanding this is not. What poet meant was probably that Ram Kinkar says, what poet meant was, I'm not supposed to be doing what I see always. So he came, came, he came with the sculpture which is without the hands, and it is just this, this was the final product, the stooping head, and he took away many things that he did looking at him, so he, come, he felt fully, you know, he got the point over here. And this is the sculpture that is in cement, which is in the National Gallery here. And we have the bronze at the Lelical Academy when you enter. One of the best known portraits of Tagore, because Tagore is one of the sculptors. So Tagore is one of the poets, one of the art, one of the intellectual visionary, whose portrait has been done by many, many sculptors. And probably this is one of the most successful portraits of the Tagore. So you can see one, the other side of the, of the bust. And you know, just to sort of show how he approaches. 
you know ramkinger always starts with a very the minimum the profile the profile of you know very thin profile that he starts and so he gets the drawing not the outer but the internal core core design of the structure of the profile because i am showing only the portraits because this is the school that ramkinger had started in shantiniketan the school of making portraits from life we never had portraits that we never copied in sculptures from the british or colonial sculptures or anything of that we always had models to work on so this is abhinandranath tagore one of the very most impressive portraits of ramkinger this is the frontal view of abhinandranath and then i'm i'm showing maybe one more portrait of ramkinger because very special about because this is binodini one of the student who came in 1940s to shantiniketan from manipur she is the princess princess binodini devi so that's like she come came from the very royal background and she was a student there and ramkinger was the teacher and they really developed certain friendship the teacher student a very beautiful relationship and he wanted to do a portrait of her where he took a absolutely different experience of getting her with very many details of very detailed work of a of a model so he this is like those who know about the kind of paintings and the drawings that he did he did many many paintings of hers and uh, also represented in drawings and etchings and all mediums and this is one of the best known portraits of of uh, of the person that ramkinger knew very well this is the other side of the vinodini you know, uh, then i am coming back just a kind of a totally different approach that sharbri roy chaudhary had taken uh, where he does sculptures of a very small scale very intimate scale unlike ramkinger who did very monumental sculptures but sharbri has taken that that's his own portrait a very maybe, maybe around 4 to 5 inches in scale and uh, you can see here the kind of detailing that he went to but this is a because the training that sharbri got was from the school on florence he went to study and then he comes back and very very western training that he had and the approach that he took was very very different from ramkinger's and this is pradosh das gupta who is the teacher of shalbiri roy chaudhary whose portrait i wanted to show you here is a very thin you know the only the profile that you can see there is nothing that you can see from front so i kind of uh, you know because he told me he i we all asked him why have you portrayed him like this with a long nose then he said yes he had a long nose that was his answer <laughs> and uh, <coughs> shadbury some of the some of the best known but one of the most successful portraits is that uh, he did many musicians and this is ali akbar khan uh, sitting for sharbari and he most of these musicians were very much willing to sit for him as a model because his the kind of knowledge that he has about the music that was they wanted to share that the musicians you know ali akbar comes and ask him sharbari can you take out the music when i was 14 years old so he would take it from the collection and make him listen that this is the final product of the ali akbar khan so there is something that is to be told about here you know it's like uh, when he was ali akbar khan was sitting for him and he was not able to get the right expression so what happened was that Ash, i think it was uh, uh, rashid khan was sort of uh, playing you know while, when he was doing the portrait and something went wrong in the tal so sharbari sharbari so everybody was looking at him and then ali akbar got out of the seat and said you know almost giving a gali to him and saying that listen what are, what are, what the hell are you doing so he got so angry and that anger that brought certain extra muscles on his face so sharbari was waiting for that to appear on his face and uh, uh, so in the absence of ali akbar he could create this beautiful portrait of ali akbar which is in the national gallery today you can look at the anger on his face and and the kind of an indianalized you know sort of a, a look towards himself so in the absence of a musician like bade gulam ali khan's portrait that he did the absence of only listening to bade gulam ali khan's music that's what he said because by the time when he wanted to do it khan sahib was not there so he completed this sculpture and it's a very beautiful one of the most beautiful piece highly talked about in the field of portraits and you can see him dancing with the head when you wanted a picture of that you can take you know and anyway, i'll give you the whole pen drive i'll give it to you 
<laughs> yeah, this is one of the most beautiful portrait of Shalbari with the, with his portrait of Bede Gulamadi. It's taken by one of his close friends, Jyotish Takraborty, the photographer. And uh, here you see a different side of Ram Kinkar. You know, nobody has seen Ram Kinkar like this. This is because Ram Kinkar was doing painting. And uh, Shalbari Rai Chaudhary, he fixed the camera and everything in the back without his knowledge and called him from behind. So he turned back. And this was the expression that Ram Kinkar gave. I mean, it's very scary. And we all knew about this portrait. So none of us dare to talk to, go to closer to Ram Kinkar with this kind of a look. But actually, he was so different. Ram Kinkar is not what we see here in this photograph, but also can be that. That's what it was. So when I saw Ram Kinkar, he was like this. A beautifully photographed by Jodi Bhatt. He went to, in 1978, Jodi Bhai came to Shanti Nikhil and asked me, Rasa, please take me to Ram Kingarada. And um, so I remember him shooting many a series of photographs like him sitting on the Muda. So I had this opportunity in 1979, a year before he passed away. Ram Kingar agreed to sit for me. And uh, I, I was so thrilled because I think when I went and told him I got a national scholarship, so he said, oh, now that I can sit for you. So he, I really, that very word when he comes out, he's, he said, then, okay, I'm going to come from tomorrow itself. So I started working in front of him. And uh, I was trying to sort of to combine, you know, two different expressions of one side, there's a kind of a smile. The other side, a kind of a serious expression, which is like a sculptor and the man integrated into one. So I did this portrait. And in, I tried to do it in his own style. Where, how he would do the kind of the raggedness and the kind of surface that he normally tries to do that. I was getting that portrait in that style. That's one of that. And this is the other side of Ram Kinkar. And uh, then I was, I was in the middle of these two sculptors. One, one side Ram Kinkar Beige and the other side Sharbari Roy Chaudhary. So this is Sharbari's sketch that I have done. He did his teacher's head with a long nose. And I did my sir, my, my shalvari without nose. <laughs> yeah, because he asked me, where is my nose? I said, well, I think uh, it is there. It is merged with many things, you know. So, uh, he, of course, he admired it. But after that, I never made an attempt of doing a portrait of him. It's not easy to get him. Because he always, he never looked straight. He always looked, you know, you know always with a stooping head and sits like that. And very difficult to do a portrait where a man is always, you know, sort of uh, sitting like that. And many, many teachers ask me, many, many people in Shanti can ask me, your teacher always is sitting like that on a rickshaw like that. Is he, does, he get, does he drink from morning hours? I said, uh, a man who never touched coffee or tea other than just plain water, but he looked so much drunk. <laughs> yes, that's because of he listens to music a lot. And he thinks that even when he's not listening to any music, he's, that is still being played, you know. So he always, and he's one of the extraordinary person, came up with the idea of great sensitive portraits. Why I'm showing these portraits, it's just because it's on, a, you know, on an occasion like this. My retrospective is happening here. And uh, it's one way of remembering my teachers and uh, their best expression and certain, certain memories. And uh, this is when I met with Musui. This is the actual Musui that I met with in Shantinigan when I was young. And he was working in a tea shop. But when I met him, he was just st standing on the right side and giving a smile. The smile, he always had it. So I asked him <coughs> to be, you know, I took him to my studio in Shantan. I, I did a life-size nude study and the portrait. And uh, I cast it into cement. Later, when I came to Delhi in 1981, I had nothing much to carry other than his portrait. That was the portrait, which was, I chopped off that head and I brought it here. And this was my permanent fixture in my studio, in, in the studios that I have shifted from one to the next. Over a period of time, Musi started appearing, reappearing in my sculptures in the mid-90s. And I'm still on with him. He is, uh, he's taking me around, or I'm taking him around both ways. It works. Uh, this is, uh, you know, when I came to Delhi in 1980s, there was no scope that I could sell any sculptures. So Mrs. Gandhi passed away in 1984, and somebody told me, well, since you know how to do portraits, why don't you do a portrait? 
of Mrs. Gandhi, then there might be some money that you can earn. So I was commissioned by Colonel Wahid, the ONGC chairman, and I, I, I was asked if I could do this portrait. I said, yes, I can try it. But when I did this portrait, he came and he did, you know, the whole team from ONGC came and rejected it and said, my God, what is it? I said, uh, I said, well, this is Mrs. Gandhi. Then he said, but, but I don't understand. Mrs. Gandhi is a very charming woman, and, and what have you made out of her? And uh, she looks so arrogant and shrewd, and, and then, you know, I, and, you know, what age are you depicting her? I said, listen, I don't know what was her age when she declared emergency, but I know my age when she declared her em the emergency. So I just said, Mrs. Gandhi, the emergency period. And then, uh, then I, I, then they originally said we have no option. We have to take it. I said, yeah, there's no other option because whatever advance you gave me, I have completed. I finished it. So it's like one of those experiences. And then uh, uh, the sculpture was rejected, but later found that this uh, it, this is not installed. But they took the bronze. So it's not installed. But that doesn't matter because at least I could really sort of complete one of the sculpture during those years. Why I'm saying this, I failed to be getting commissions. I understood I'm not good if somebody asked me to do a sculpture. Because I would do it in my own way, which doesn't really give any chance for others to accept it. So I really, can, I really thought I, I'm not the person who can do statues and commission jobs. And uh, uh, in 19, I think 50 years of, 50 or 40 years of, of uh, India's independence, I was told by the government, if we, can, you give, can you make a portrait of Nehru at the same time, similar, 87? I said, I'll be very happy to do Nehru's head. It's all because of money. I was wanting some money to make your own sculptures. So I did the sculpture, and the sculpture has, the, the, the Nehru has no, no cap and no rose. So I was told, no, no, can you put a cap on him? Then we'll accept it. I said, I'm sorry, I will not do a cap on him because... I have done it this way. It's a Kashmiri, beautiful Kashmiri Brahmin, you know, uh, the personality is such that it has the human side of Nehru. May not be too much of an image of a political image that you are looking at. No, if you put the cap, we will just give you so much money. No, I, it, was, it was rejected by them. But later, Gopal Gandhi and Mr. Varavarajan, they came to my house. And then when Gopal Gandhi became the director of Nehru Center, said that, oh, I, we understand that you have a Nehru that is rejected by many people, but can we look at it? So anyway, he took personally, he installed this sculpture in Nehru Center, and uh, I'm very happy that it's there. It's, the, it's in London Nehru Center, the way it is. I had recently, I don't do many portraits, but I had a chance to, I was invited to do a portrait of Abdul Kalam, sir. And uh, when I went to meet him, so he told me that, Oh, Radha Krishnan, listen, you have come to do a portrait of a president. I said, yes, I have come to do a portrait of you, but you will not get me, because this, what you are seeing me, you know, with this kind of dressed up president, is not what I am. We beautifully, beautifully, very well said. I was, sort of, I was trying to understand what exactly it is. Then he told me to get me, we have to go out to the Mughal garden and see me in nature. So he took me out. And we, were, we spent a couple of hours walking, you know, in the, in the garden, and, he, and I really understood what he meant by how to get Abdul Kalam Saab to, to really get the kind of right expression, you know. So that was the last portrait probably I have done, you know. Though I was told to do it, but I enjoyed doing it. And that's the way I have ultimately, because there was, when I completed this portrait, I mean, he was extremely happy about it, and uh, he... He said, I don't have anybody else to uh, judge. Um, by myself, I'm looking at it. <laughs> I don't have anybody else to sort of ask, well, how does it look or whatever. You know, I'm sure you have done that, you know, the way, but I'm also seeing me in a different form. And uh, that's the way I, I mean, in terms of portrait, some of the certain experiences that I wanted to share with you. And uh, because portrait matters in my sculptures, most of the sculptures, the expression, the, the, uh, the, the facial expression, that really carries a lot. And with the Musu's head, too, many other portraits. Even with Christine, when I was sort of uh, working on, 
or Mimi's head. These are the two heads which is here, which are exhibited, and it was always uh, getting, you know, doing portrait, you get to know the person better, or you know the person better, that gives you a chance to do the portrait, both ways it works. So, well, you have anything connected to what I have shown, and some of the sculptures around, well, I'm ready to take the questions on that. But uh, it's very good that Sardhan took out the name of that experience of talking about structure, and structure matters. It's always that's what we are carrying still. We don't look at, we don't look at too much of resemblance, but we, we really idealize the figures. It's not, ex it has nothing to do with the kind of anatomical structure that the people have, the normal jo physical structure that is carried, but we always create a structure. I create a structure independent of Musui, which has nothing to do with something, the actual Musui. Thank you. I just wanted to remind you of that early commissioned work that you did for International Travel House yeah. of Musui uh, pulling that rickshaw with a crow sitting on, That's right. on top. Just a bit, if you could just tell us. Yeah, yeah that was in 1997 with the International Travel House in Sheikh Sarai. They have, a, they have their headquarters here. They asked me if I could do a sculpture based on the travel as an idea. So when I thought, since I'm coming from Kolkata, and uh, you know, travel for me was a man carrying you know, per another person to one destination, you know, where from wherever that he is or he was. So this process of this, that thing itself is so, there's a human drama in the whole exercise. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 I started doing some small models and the actual size rickshaw was brought from Kolkata and that we casted it. Then I was just thinking who would be carrying that, who would be the puller? That's when I really looked at the smiling face that was a constantly a fixture in my studio. I, almost like I'm asking Musi, could you be one? That was the first time he agreed to me. So that I made a full, I gave the face, I gave the full body to the face. So then Musi comes and it was, it's almost like choreographed, kind of a touched up on that. It's not like that he's pulling or struggle. So I think that smiling face with the crow is crow is sort of placed on the top. It's like carrying, you know, you are carrying a memory along. The bird somehow stands for that. It comes and flies away. But like any other memories that we all have it. All right, we can have questions on the floor. Anybody is interested in raising a few issues? Mr. Sadhanan, um, you started the, the talk with provocation. So I, I want to come back to that and ask you, what is it you've you've obviously known Mr. Radha Krishnan's work and him for a long, long time? So what what is it that you see has what has he provoked uh, over this time? What how you see that provocation of his work uh, three, four decades or longer? Yeah, I guess uh, even from his uh, earliest days, like I said, uh, it's this is a kind of luck that is that doesn't come to everybody to have a to have a teacher, a guru who provokes you to work against the grain. I mean, you're working in a, supposing you're working, you're, you're, you're learning in a school or a college and your, your professor tells you, look, I don't want an essay from you, just tear the paper. You know, talk about the work in a different way, talk about the subject in a different way. Let me understand the blood and guts of what you're experiencing in your, in your, in your thought and in your ideas. Rather, exceptionally lucky he has been to work under these two masters, two extremely different people. Uh, Ramkinka Baj, uh, kind of, not necessarily formally taught, more self-taught. He, he was a student of Kala Bhavana and all that, but uh, he had his completely his own take on you know. And uh, it wasn't a schooled sensibility. Many of us who go through art schools, we, we develop a schooled sensibility. We, we have a discipline. And I think uh, Ramkinka Baj is... Uh, greatest contribution was that, uh, I mean, which he transmitted was that he was, he was not disciplined, he was an anti-disciplinarian. And in that sense, uh, he transmitted that brilliantly to some of his students. And uh, this is whole thought that uh, it's not the form that is important, but it's the spirit within, it's the uh, ambience that, that the form brings out. It's not the solidity, but actually the immater immateriality of the material. The, something like that. It's, it's, a, it's difficult to formulate this in words, but when you see it, you say, aha, you know, this is it. So, 
when i first saw uh, radha's work in his studio in kirki village uh, where he was with ramu and i was going to write a write a piece on it and i have this peculiar problem in writing i i i simply cannot start any article un- until i get the headline first i must <laughs> either an image or a headline must be there otherwise i, I just can't write it. it it doesn't happen and it's been a disappointment to many artists who asked me to write and i've not been able to write because the headline hasn't come so the moment i saw his work the headline came and it, that's what we used eventually in economic times so the headline said uh, music uh, making music with hot metal it's it's a riff from the idea of metal i mean uh, metal music and uh, it's a allusion to how a sculptural work which is solid can actually melt in front of your eyes and have a musical you know sort of feature so uh, that's very much there in his, uh, you, many of them are in the exhibition you'll see in the ground floor uh, some absolutely stunning stuff uh, which don't have a narrative within them uh, but when he arrived at the uh, moiva and the uh, uh this series of sculptures uh, there is a narrativity within that and sometimes that can be i think uh how do you say not not necessarily a plus point uh, because uh, it's like i look at this and say ah i get it i understand it this is a group this is a this is a peop- group of people walking it could be a it could be a march it could be a protest uh it could be uh, uh, a bunch of people who have come to see an event maybe they are attending what we are we are speaking here we are discussing here uh it's like a jamghat uh now this immediate understanding of something you know this at first look i look at it, ah it's a book i know it it's a book i'm going to read it i'm going to open it etc so that, that is detrimental to an artistic process that's i i feel that strongly i feel the artist has to create that provocation where even if i say yeah i understand it the next step I, should be oh, oh god i didn't get it oh this is very difficult oh this is something that i, I didn't anticipate it, that it, that that's a, a new intervention in my thought process so i think in radha's work you'll see that uh, ability to pull you out of your com- comfort frame and uh, represent that idea in a in a in a very provocative way and uh, this is not this is not easy in contemporary sculpture provocation mostly comes from abstract work figurative work is very very difficult because like i said figurative work lends itself to an easy comprehensibility whereas you know which it can be completely wrong the artist had something else in mind and i have some other understanding of it but i'm comfortable ah, i understand it it's a man it's a woman it's a bird it's a this uh so it's the uh, abstract sculptors who therefore have you know a bigger kind of a, uh let's say media space in one sense or 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 uh, academic space in one sense because uh that that is considered to be more open to interpretation so the figurative artists has to work much much harder i'd like to thank all of you and uh, it is indeed a pleasure you know for us at gallery navya to host radha krishnan's uh, retrospective has been it's a privilege it's an honor and it's great to have you all here for the seminar thank you very much each one of you thank you and join us for a cup of tea or coffee whatever you'd like thanks again bye thank you.